Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the eighth session of Sonoikis Digital Classics Summer Semester 2019. Uh, today, uh, our guest is Chiara Palladino. She is assistant professor at Furman University in the United States. And uh, Chiara is going to talk about linked open data for archaeology. And uh, well, we have uh, been talking a lot about, uh, in general, um, linked open data, linked open data for the ancient world. Um, in Sunoikis, is not this semester, but in other semesters and also in Leipzig uh, during my course for digital philology. But today we have uh, um, a session about linked open data for archaeology. And Chiara will talk about her experience in the classroom at Furman University working with cultural heritage uh, sites and then we, she will also talk about uh, Peripleto. So Chiara, welcome back. Of course Chiara, she well, has been contributing a lot to, to Synoikisis uh, since the beginning when she was in Leipzig with us. So welcome back and thank you for your contribution to the program. Thank you Monica. It's, it's really nice to be back. Um, so without further ado, I think I'm going to share my screen and uh, we want to start with uh, our session. So, okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Chiara, can you hide? There is a bar. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. There we go. Um, so, the main subject of this session is uh, essentially an experiment that my students and I. Um, decided to do during the fall semester in a course in classical archaeology. We wanted to use linked open data resources uh, and everything that's available in the cultural heritage on the web to try to see if we could gather some information about specific archaeological sites. Um, so I'm going to give you a very short introduction to linked open data uh, and specifically to its usage in the cultural heritage in case you're not familiar with this. Uh, I'm going to very, very briefly talk about the specific project uh, that provided the framework for our exploration, the Pelagios project, which uh, many of you would be familiar with already if you are you know, usual guests and usual students at the Sunoikis Digital Classics Consortium. And then I'm going to introduce uh, more in detail the experiment that we did in the classical archaeology um, course. So to start with linked open data very, very quickly, um, I thought it was useful to give you some essential bibliography because this is not the first time that we talk about linked open data at Sinoikis. Just last fall, um, Valeria Vitale, Gabi Bodard, and Hugh Kalis and other people presented about linked open data for cultural heritage. That is a great session for you to gather some essential information about, also about the technical aspects of linked open data. And of course, as always, the very important paper uh, by Berners Lee, which is called Linked Open Data, Linked Data, and um, the programming historian has also a very nice introduction to the principle to the principles of linked open data. It gives you the technical requirements and some ideas about how to do linked open data and how to understand linked open data in general. So I'm going. I'm just going to start by stealing one of the slides of Hugh Kalis um, that they did last fall to describe you the problem that we have in terms of applying linked open data. So in the web, we uh, are in a situation where we have so many web resources about the cultural heritage. We have museum websites, coin collections. Uh, we have archaeological atlases and a lot of other stuff. So the problem is, how do we connect them and how do we contextualize the information that they have? Because an archaeological site and cultural heritage in general are, you know, multifaceted situations. They are made of the connections between different pieces of evidence, different uh, scholarly products and so on. So how do we connect them together so that people can understand what's actually going on? And also how do we keep them up to date so that they can benefit from the new information that comes from other projects and other websites? I'm going to add one last thing to Hugh's uh, slide, which is how do we use this problem and how do we use cultural heritage resources in general to make it more uh, usable for non-specialists, which in my case includes also students. Um, 
So this is basically the situation. And remember this slide because we will come back to this. We have cultural heritage resources, museum curators, archives, and we also have gazetteers that provide uh, in an online web-based form uh, the geographical context for that information. So the result, the possible solution to this process is linked open data. And for those of you who are not familiar with this concept, linked open data is uh, one of the crucial components of the semantic web. And it basically provides um, a set of technologies, a, a set of standards that in enable you to link together content that belongs to different um, sites, that belongs to different resources. Um, what linked open data does, actually what linked data does, is to provide you certain rules and protocols that will enable you to establish those linkings. Um, and if you have a set of projects that comply to linked open data standards, then you're able to link them all together. So there are five things that you should do if you want to comply to linked data five star standard, as Dean Berners Lee um, denominated it. So the first one is that you have to publish your data on the web, preferably with an open license, such as like Creative Commons can be, for example. Um, that means that people should be able to reuse, rebuild, and improve your data for their own purposes. Second, you have to structure your data in a machine-readable format. That is very important. Your data should not be a scan of an image or of a book. It should be something that a machine can read. And for that, in that regard, you have to, you should use non-proprietary formats and protocols to encode your data, like plain text or CSV, for example, my two favorite ones, uh, but also HTML, JSON is very popular, XML, TI, and so on. Four, you have to use open web standards to describe your data, such as RDF and Sparkle. We'll talk about these two formats very briefly uh, in the next slides. The use of open standards is important because um, it ensures, it partly ensures to a certain extent, the possibility that people will understand the formats that you have used um, in a foreseeable future. So with open standards, at least all the definitions of all the requirements of the format that you have used will be available to people in the future. Um, and then finally, you have to do all of the above, plus you have to link to other people's data. So the essential technology that provides a foundation for linked open data is uh, URIs to identify the data and the technology of RDF and Sparkle to organize, that is, provide relations between your data. And you may be familiar with this already. The URIs, Uniform Resource Identifiers, are strings of characters that are used to identify a resource in a stable, machine actionable, and unique way. So that means that when your data is identified with URIs, they are going to be denominations that will last in the future and will be uniquely referred to your resource. Of course, what you actually want to identify is really a matter of how you design your information. Uh, you need to decide what you want to designate and how you want to refer to that piece of information. And your data needs to be linkable, again, linked data. Um, and the way you do that is through URLs, which is Uniform Resource Locators. And these are the way through which we link your eyes together. The URLs are basically the web addresses that you see on the browser. Uh, and it can also look very similar to URIs to a certain extent. The difference is that while the URIs describe the resource itself, the URLs describe its location on the web. So URIs can also describe things that are not on the web. The essential thing about URIs is that they identify information. URLs describe the, the location of that resource on the web, so they cannot refer to things that are not on the web. And then finally, you organize your information, that is, you state relations between your resources by using two of the most popular formats that um, we generally refer to when we talk about linked data, RDF and Sparkle. RDF is, again, one of those open web standards that we discussed in the previous slides, and it enables you to establish links between the types of resource that you have, which should be expressed as you arise. Um, and of course, prior to that, you have to establish like what exactly you want to link and what types of links you want to express between the resources. Once you have done that, you can use RDF. Um, and RDF statements are essentially triples that connect a subject, a predicate, and an object. 
um, and your eyes are usually understood to be the subject and the predicate and the, and the object is can be a URI, but also can be another type of information like a string or numbers, for example. Um, and these triples produced with, with RDF can also be reciprocally linked. So you can create a network of information with RDF. Uh, and you can also decide to define the properties that is the semantic type of predicates that connect information by using a schema or an ontology. We will talk briefly about that. Um, Finally, you would query this network, this graph of relationships to a language that's called Sparkle. You may be more familiar with the RDF data format um, as it is expressed in the open annotation standard. And open annotation is one of the most common ways in which humanists in particular uh, express relations between resources in a linked data environment. Uh, and it enables you to express relations that don't have a declared semantic characterization in them. That means you use this sort of connection to establish a link between things, but you do not say what nature of link that is, what kind of relation there is between those two things. You just say that there is a relation. So the annotation is basically what connects two things. One thing is called a target, which is the thing that you're annotating. And the second thing is a body, which is usually um, some sort of identification uh, that you would find expressed as a URI in a database or in a authoritative reference, for example, a gazetteer. Uh, and you probably know, uh, but I will just tell you, uh, the Pelagius project has a tool that does exactly that, uh, Recogito, through which you can essentially identify places, people, events, and connect them by means of open annotation to specific references in authorities and authoritative resources. Um, and this is what it looks like in terms of RDF. Uh, you can see that there is a target, which represents the resource. There is a body, which represents um, the uh, query, the, I'm sorry, the uh, URI in the gazetteer. And you can also add additional information, like who annotates that when the annotation is performed. So we can say that this target, like Sparta, refers to this particular entity in Pleiades. And I can say today that like this is part of it's essentially the same thing as you know attaching a little post-it to your book um, through a reference to an available authority like a gazetteer or an atlas obviously you may want to semantically characterize the information that is expressed by means of those relations um, so rdf and uh, open annotation in particular are not necessarily good for every single project. Um, and there are ways to express the semantics of those relations. Uh, and often, linked data ontologies are used to do that. Remember that in previous slides, I mentioned the possibility of applying a schema or ontology to your RDF. Um, and in cultural heritage in particular, we use uh, the ontology that was designed you know, to roll them all, the CEDOC CRM. Um, and this is one of the most frequently used ontologies to express information on cultural heritage data. So what CDOCRM does is to offer you an ontology of semantically meaningful relationships between entities, between resources. Um, and this enables you to express information, uh, very granular information about the time period and the type of the artifact, the find spot, the place of preservation, the historical information that is connected to the thing, and so on. So it is an extremely detailed ontology that um, engages deeply with the semantic architecture of the resource and uh, the conceptual modeling that you may have in mind. So obviously, there will be advantages and disadvantages in, in using linked open data and cultural heritage. I want to focus on the advantages, not because there are no disadvantages, but because um, this is important for the pedagogical outcomes of this experiment. Um, linked open data enables you to have a lot of connectivity, specific connectivity between different resources on the web, provided that those resources use URIs to indicate things that we all, always refer to, like places, people, and so on, and that your, those URIs are sensible. Um, it enables you to have contextualization of the data in a mutual way, that means like every resource links to another one and that other one provides further information, but they also enrich themselves uh, reciprocally. And I don't have to mention this necessarily, but I think that you always imagine this, 
you have an extremely improved discoverability and improved navigation of all the resources that are connected by means of linked data. And finally, providing these standards ensures long-term sustainability. Of course, there are problems, as I mentioned, like for example, how do we describe uncertainty, um, which is a thing, as you know, in the humanities and in cultural heritage, how do we describe uh, the evolution of a resource and the change across time, um, and also the concept for uh, the concept of semantics of relations is not necessarily um, straightforward, um, and it can be quite paradoxically a hindrance to further interoperability. But again, I want to focus on the advantages and particularly on the discoverability and uh, the connectivity because this is relevant to what we are going to talk about in a minute. So. For those of you who in the past few years lived on Mars, I'm going to introduce the Pelagios project, which I'm sure a lot of you know at this point, um, but for the few of you who don't, the Pelagios project, Pelagios is um, an acronym for Pelagios enabling to ancient geodata in open systems. And basically, uh, Pelagios provides an infrastructure for linking together information about the ancient and pre-modern world using linked open data methods. And so uh, this is why we talk about linked open geodata. Um, and it sits in an RDF-based framework, which means that every piece of information has its own type of URI, and it's a, which is something that identified uh, identifies that as an entity that can exist in a web of other resources. And this entity can be linked to other data complying to the same framework. So Pelagios is not, as we often say, it's not a data aggregator. It's not a collection of things. It just provides um, the technology or rather the common reference for other web resources, other data aggregators to put their information together, to enable them to link the resources together. So what it does is to use information about places, uh, which is provided often by the gazetteers, and gazetteers are you know, upfront in using URI-based information, to provide one common reference to all the information that is stored in cultural heritage resources. So remember this slide, we have a bunch of online gazetteers and we have, on the other side, we have the curators of the data, like uh, museums, archives, uh, collections of texts, digitally available, and so on. What Pelagios does is to connect all of this information together by using linked open data technology. Um, so once the curator of the online resources comply to very, very small, easy uh, technological standards, Pelagios is able to link them together by using place names as a common denominator. And the benefit is that this um, spatial context that is provided through this information, through this technology, uh, gives you mutual contextualization. Basically, I already said this, all the resources that are in the Pelagios network are able to be linked by means of Pelagios, but are also able to harvest further information from the other databases and resources that are hosted in the Pelagios network. So everybody wins, basically. Everybody has access to possibly improved and up-to-date information from other projects by means of the technology provided by Pelagios. And the result is we have this amazing network of more than 58 partners from different countries, a lot of open annotations performed by users, and a lot of linked information that puts together a very complex and nuanced picture of the ancient world. Because the idea behind Pelagios is that the ancient world is not just you know, flat representation of historical information. It is the result of interlacing together very different bits of evidence and very different bits of information. Um, there is a lot of things that uh, give us this very complex um, idea of the ancient world, this very complex reconstruction. There are texts, there are archaeological sites, there are inscriptions, there are museum objects, there are archives, there are archaeological findings, and any other resource online that provides some sort of information about a particular place in the ancient world will contribute some evidence to this network. Um, recently, Pelagios has become Commons, which is uh, 
more putting putting more emphasis on the community aspect um, of the project. And what they do is providing a lot of resources for prospect contributors or researchers and students who want to, you know, be in the linked open geodata network. Uh, and they also provide some support for uh, the production and curation of digital data. Um, and they also provide Recogito, as I mentioned, which is a tool for annotating um, documents, uh, texts, or maps that have some interest in terms of space. But I'm not going to talk about Recogito today. What I really want to talk about is Peripleo. Um, Peripleo is the other resource that is provided by the Pelagios project. Um, and what it is very powerful for is to express concretely, in a very practical way, the power of linking together resources by means of linked open data. Um, and this is a tool that we used in our exploration uh, in class, so it is particularly important for me to talk about it. So Periplayer was, um, it is, it's basically an answer to the question, how can we effectively use linked open data resources in a context of non-specialists and in a content of people who are not data curators, but are users and make good use of the possibilities of these um, linked world in such a way that is empowering for humans um, and not just for machines. So Periplayo is a tool that empowers this experience of exploration across linked resources. Um, the first version was launched in 2015, uh, I think, and it is defined as the linked data exploration engine of Pelagios. So it doesn't provide you an aggregation of the data that are hosted in Pelagios, because Pelagios has no data again. Uh, it provides you a way of linking together all the resources that are hosted by the partners of Pelagios. Um, so it basically offers you the possibility of querying uh, an immense variety of information across the various partners of the Pelagios network. Um, what it offers you initially is this map-based visualization that enables you to give some sort of spatial contextualization to your exploration of the data. And basically, it sits on an API that provides like mas machine access to the partner's data, uh, which is in a format that which has to be in a format that can be questioned by the engine. Um, the data model is based on entities, uh, which are now, for the moment, four. We have people, time periods, places, and data sets. Like, I don't know, a data set can be Herodotus's work divided into books or a coin collection. Um, so the underlying structure of Peripleo is a layer that sits on top of all the data of the partners, and it makes them compatible for queries for search. This is uh, a view of the search space of Peripleo. It is uh, rather complex, so there are several parts that you need to pay attention to when you are um, performing a search. Uh, usually, you can search for different things, as we mentioned. You can search for time periods, you can search for people, you can search for things, objects, and you can search for places. Um, so when you type something, what the map will immediately give you is an idea of how many resources can be plotted on the map that are uh, somehow related to the thing that you're looking for. Uh, the map, again, exists because the linking strategy of Pelagios sits on the concept of place. So it will give you references. So all the information that you see plotted on the map has references to a place that is connected to the information that you want to find. Um, so when you type something uh, on the search bar, you will have different types of filters, different types of things that you can see, and you will have also a very detailed result list that can also have pictures in it. Um, so from the beginning, you can use the search box. Um, I'm not running a demo today because I don't particularly trust live demos. I'm just um, relying on my slides here. Um, so you can basically use the search box uh, to search by keyword, and you can search a variety of things. And Periplayer already suggests you uh, gives you suggestions about specific search terms or records that can match your query. Uh, and then you can run the query by hitting Enter. Um, and what it will give you is a list of particular results. You can filter those results 
um, by means of uh, the time period that you want to look for or by means of the specific type of resource that you're looking for. And you can see that the search bar has a color code. It uses the orange for objects, it uses the green for periods, and it uses the blue for places. Um, so you can decide exactly what type of information, what type of results you want to look for. If you click on objects, it will list the number of objects that your result, your results have, and it will isolate only those. It will filter only object information. So, um, Pelagios doesn't provide fixed connections between things. That means um, it doesn't give you specific answers. It enables you to perform an exploration. Um, this is why sometimes the results of the search may seem kind of fuzzy because humanities data are naturally fuzzy and there is some sort of casualty or serendipity, if you want, um, to searches that are run in a humanities environment. So what you see as a result of your search is several records for the entity you looked for, not necessarily meaningful for your, for your research. Um, so you have to be um, a little bit of an explorer here. Uh, and you have to be very familiar with the type of resources that you want to look for, and possibly also with the um, web resources that are provided to you by Pelagios. So as a result, if you see the dots on the map, um, they do not only link to one single thing, they just tell you that there is a variety of data linked together connected to that particular dot that represents a place on the map. So what uh, Peripleo gives you is not just a set of geographical information there, a set of places there. It gives you everything that may be connected to a particular place. So it gives you information about archaeological artifacts uh, that may be linked to that place, which is the fun spot for them or is the place of preservation for them. Or it may link you to a text that names that place. So again, there is a, a little bit of fuzziness here, but this is important because um, what we want to empower is the opportunity of the user to explore different kinds of data. And as you can see, there is a fairly good amount of um, information and types of information that you can harvest through Pelagios. This is an incomplete list of all the partners and the data sources that uh, are indexed by Peripleo. And you can see that there is a variety of things here. There are atlases, there are coin collections, uh, there are different types of text collections, um, there are a variety of gazetteers, there are heritage gazetteers, of course, um, there are inscription databases, and so on. So the potential for this search is to be able to harvest information about a lot of things, about uh, an extreme variety of pieces of evidence and of information. So here we go um, with the experiment that I decided to perform. My particular interest was to see if Periplay or any general linked open data technologies provided um, enough information and a technology that was sufficiently navigable um, for users and for particularly students um, to find meaningful information about places of cultural heritage importance. Um, so I decided to give them a little project. Um, I'm referring to, again, a class of classical archaeology that happened in the fall of 2018, so last year, at Furman University. And all of the students, we had uh, 24 students, uh, and they were undergraduate. So it was a fairly interesting uh, audience where to perform this experiment. So we focused on the use of uh, linked open data databases and resources. Um, I wanted to use the advantages of linked open data, uh, and particularly of Peripleo, because Peripleo is based on places. So Pelagios in general is based on places as a way of linking together resources. Um, and the reason for this is because I wanted to investigate specific archeological sites. So that looked like a perfect match to me. 
because Peripleo gives us a fairly good amount of information about specific archaeological sites, and also because geographical information provides context to the data. So we didn't have to dig too much into um, querying information or searching for information about find spots or places of preservation and so on if we had to look about one information about one specific site. Um, and finally, again, Peripleo gives access to several pieces of information, several types of information. And finally, one of the side advantages of using Peripleo in the classroom was to look for things, um, information that are not necessarily covered by traditional textbooks and traditional archaeology courses um, because of the variety of the information that can be covered through linked open data technologies. And I will give you some examples, some concrete examples of this. So for those of you who are interested uh, in the syllabus in the GitHub page of this session, I included as a possible project, as a possible assignment, exactly what I did, um, what I gave to my students, uh, which is a project that's named Tell a Story with Material Culture. Um, what I wanted them to do was to perform navigation in Peripleo and I also included a couple of, in, a couple of things, uh, instructions uh, in a separate document to provide them, you know, a navigational aid uh, in the possibly not particularly intuitive environment of Peripleo. This is called How to Search Archaeological Objects Running to Open Data. And you can have that because it's linked in the GitHub page for this session. Um, so what they had to do was to think about an archaeological site or a place that they wanted to know more about. Um, and I will tell you the variety of places that they investigated in a minute. And they should use Peripleo and other websites like Pleiades um, that are also linked to open databases to select five objects that represented a bit of information about that particular place. Obviously, taking into account the particular chronological period and the particular context of those objects. Uh, and it could be a variety of things, obviously. I give them some examples. References in a, class in a classical text, um, a nearby settlement, an inscription, pottery, sculpture, a mosaic, a monument, coins, and so on. Um, and then they had to create cards for each item detailing the most important information about it. About it. Um, so the cards had to be very schematic, but they had to include at least the name or title of the object or of the monument, um, a date or date range, a description, uh, an image, if they were able to find one. We'll see that not always we were able to find images. Um, the site of finding, the site of preservation, and the URL. Um, then they had to write a short paper about um, trying to connect all these objects together to form a coherent story. Um, and they had to include the item cards, of course. And they also had to prepare a presentation about the project. We actually had the timer uh, when they did the presentation. So if you want to do this, there are the details um, to perform this assignment on your own or in class in the GitHub page. So again, as I mentioned, what Peripleo empowers is the possibility of starting from a place and gathering information from an extreme variety, an extremely good variety of resources. We were able to harvest information from um, databases of um, places themselves, like gazetteers, photos, or connections, or objects of archaeological interest, uh, connected places and monuments, um, travel logs, texts, and I mean, a variety of things, right? Um, which is at the same time the challenge of an experiment like this, because you have to learn how to navigate into the complexity of um, this experiment. But the result is, again, coming back to the slide, that you gain an understanding of how complex, again, how uh, multifaceted the ancient world is, and that you cannot just take one piece of evidence in consideration. You would not understand the entire complexity of the ancient world by just looking at one piece of evidence. You have to include everything. So for example, um, during the exploration, we use a variety of resources. The ones that I'm linking here, that I'm, that I'm listing here are, were the most frequently used for a variety of reasons. Uh, Pleiades, of course, was one of the most important because uh, we were able to gather information about the site itself. For those of you who don't know, 
Pleiades as one of the most important gazetteers of the ancient and pre-modern world that is available online. And um, it is also encoded in link to open data format. So Prairie Player will link you to Pleiades uh, and to information in Pleiades. Um, what Pleiades also provides is connections to other spatial entities that may be of interest and attested chronologies and denominations at the very least. Um, Flickr was also particularly important because we were able to um, get images um, and Flickr has connections to Pleiades as well. So it was particularly relevant for us to be able to access to images of objects found on the sites in question or to particular museum collections. Uh, FASTI Online was also particularly important to gather up-to-date information about excavations on active sites. Nomisma and all the related databases that are in the Nomisma universe, so to say, uh, were fundamental. A lot of students found coins that pertain to the site that they were investigating. Um, Perseus and Topos texts, of course, were the most important ones that mentioned that contain texts mentioning the sites in question. And some of the students actually found that information particularly useful. Um, Wiki.org, of course, that gave us particular archaeological information about the site and sometimes images of the excavated area, which were, of course, crucial again. Um, not all of the resources at our disposal give us images, so these were particularly precious. Um, epigraphic databases, of course, particularly the Heidelberg epigraphic database uh, that stored inscriptions mentioning the site or being found on the site. Um, the Idai Gazetteer and uh, the underlying structure of Arachne, um, which gave us information about objects, again, found on the site or the history of those objects or of the excavation. Um, and finally, Europeana, that again, provided metadata and images, sometimes chronological information about the stuff that we were looking for. What is interesting is that in the course of the experiment, we were also able to look for um, resources that were sort of out of the network, that were not um, Pelagius partners, uh, but somehow they were linked uh, in the other resources that we were investigating. Some of them not even linked to open data based, uh, like the epigraphic database of Roma, for example, Rome um, is not linked to open data compatible. They don't follow yet the linked open data technology. So, um, but we were able to gather information from that database because it's connected to the epigraphic database of Heidelberg. Uh, the Bodleian Library collection of Herculaneum papyri as well uh, is not a resource that is uh, linked to open data compatible, and it's also not uh, a Pelagius partner yet, we may say, um, or local museum databases and websites. And this is where I think it gets really interesting. Um, we were able to harvest information, especially when we were looking for images. Uh, we were able to look for um, those in museum databases and websites of local archaeological sites. Uh, and finally, obviously, Wikimedia and Wikipedia, which are not uh, officially Pelagius partners, but were all over the place for obvious reasons. So in the last minutes that we have, I'm going to tell you something about what my students did. And if you're interested in having a more direct um, testimony of their experience and the advantages that they found and the problems that they found in the exploration, I'm going to tell you that um, these students in particular that I'm going to mention are going to present their experiment and their projects in the DH 2019 International Conference in Utrecht. So if you're going to be there, you are going to be able to listen to them uh, talking about this experience. Um, so I'm going to give you four particular examples of students that, uh, well, not only got a very good grade, but um, used the resources in a way they thought was interesting and thoughtful. And we're also able to gather information that was uh, relevant in terms of the diversity of the pieces of evidence and in terms of the variety of um, information that they were able to find. So Caroline Trammell, for example, she looked for Alexandria in Egypt. Um, that is a surprisingly more complicated place to investigate than what you may think, uh, just because there are there is an endless number of Alexandrias that you can find on the atlas. And since Perry Pleo gives you all the results of for for Alexandria, 
it may be initially particularly difficult to navigate into this immense amount of resources. Um, but Caroline obviously was able to find um, information about uh, sites of particular archaeological interest and artifacts um, that she investigated in terms of examples of cultural exchange uh, in this place between the first and the third century in particular, uh, so the late time uh, of Alexandria. And she found a variety of things. I'm just going to uh, give you an idea. Um, this one is a Serapium of Alexandria, of which she found an image, by the way, on Wikimedia. Um, she also found some examples of artifacts, artistic artifacts that <clears throat> uh, were taken as examples of the widespread uh, influence of Mediterranean art. She found coins, as, as we mentioned. This is one of the examples, the Maximianus's coin. And she was able to find mosaics, like the Villa of the Birds, which was taken as one of the most relevant examples of not only of Roman art in Egypt, but also as a way to understanding how Roman buildings shaped um, the neighborhoods of Alexandria and shaped the space in the area. And finally, the so-called Pompey's Pillar, which is a triumphal column that was actually erroneously identified as Pompey's uh, by Diocletian to commemorate a victory over an Alexandria revolt, which was particularly interesting to Caroline because it signified that the relations between uh, the local, the, the external rulers and the locals weren't always particularly friendly. So again, Caroline was able to write a paper by using these single pieces of evidence, tracing a story of how the interactions between external and external people, like the Romans, um, interacted with locals in different ways by just looking at pieces of um, at material pieces of evidence. Rebecca Fulford looked for a place in Greece that is particularly important for various reasons in the history of ancient Greece and mythology, in particular, Eleusis. Uh, for Eleusis, she was able to find a variety of things. Um, Hiera Oikia, which is represented in this case, was a sacred house that was uh, that has been excavated in Eleusis. And what's interesting about it is that Rebecca was able to find this in the Perseus collections. For those of you who don't know, Perseus has uh, a set of collections of archaeological artifacts and information about uh, cultural heritage sites. And again, it's not linked to Penita compatible, but we were able to find information nevertheless. Um, or one of the most interesting examples that we were able to find is a wall fragment ceramic that was found in Lucis, which is one of the most important uh, pieces of evidence that Rebecca used to understand, again, the importance of rituals, particularly the famous Eleusinian mysteries in the area. Um, and this was a piece that we don't really have a reconstruction of, so everything um, had to be understood from the actual iconography that the piece shows. Um, and the available images that we had. And there are also other pieces that are a bit more complex, so to say, like this particular pottery fragment that hasn't been deciphered, it's just a fragment. And this was particularly powerful in my opinion because it gave people an example of um, how archeological evidence is not always clear, is not always, actually most of the times, um, on an archaeological excavation, you have to reconstruct the, the history of a place from very, very mysterious and very problematic fragments, uh, particularly if we're talking about pottery. Um, James Bergman, uh, another student, looked for information about Ostia Antica, which is a Roman site. Um, and he investigated information about Ostia from the very beginning, from the founding of the city to the late antique period. Um, he started with the inscription of the city's founding. So his um, search was partly social, partly historical, as we will see. Um, the inscription of the city's founding is another interesting example of how we were able to link information together. He found the first text of this, of this inscription on the epigraphic database of Heidelberg. However, we were able to harvest further information through the epigraphic database of Rome because um, Heidelberg hosts those links, despite the fact that the, the, that the ADR doesn't have um, linked open data technology in itself. 
And these are a couple of other examples of what James found. The tomb of Caius Cartilius, Cartilius Poplicola, which is a monumental tomb to one of the most prominent citizens in Ostia at the very beginning, going through the, Augustus, the Augustan time, the form of corporations, and finally to the late um, Claudian period with the Ostia synagogue, which is again, one of the most interesting examples of syncretism um, in the Julio-Claudian period. And finally, James was able to find a reference to Ostia in a text, the 12 Caesars of Suetonius. Um, and the source of this was Topos text. For those of you who don't know, again, Topos text is a collection of digital texts that um, are particularly researchable, queryable for information about places, about place and names. So Topos text has been um, the texts in Topos text, sorry for the uh, word game, have, have been harvested to find mentions of place names in them. And so you can query them by means of a specific place name. And this is all uh, a result of a search on Peripleo. Eleanor Mixon looked for another site that provided a lot of information, Herculaneum, not surprisingly. Um, she was particularly interested in finding information about cults and uh, their evolution in time. But as you will see, we also find some, found something that was a bit more interesting than that. Um, so for example, Eleanor focused on statues initially, like this terracotta statuette of, Isis, of the Isis lactans, um, Isis breast, breastfeeding, that um, was particularly interesting for as an attestation of the cult of Isis in Roman times, even in Southern Italy. Um, a votive inscription with the name of Heracles on it. Um, and again, in this particular case, we were not able to find the image, but we were able to find two different pieces of information by means of the ADH, the Epigraphic Database, Heidel the database Heidelberg, and the EDR, the Epigraphic Database of Rome. Through the search, however, um, Eleanor found in information that was a bit more fascinating and a bit more interesting. Specifically, she was able to find the House of Carbonized Furniture. And for those of you who don't know, this is a, one of the houses that was completely um, destroyed um, during the uh, Vulcan eruption, but it is amazingly well preserved and there is plenty of images on the web that you can see. And it is particularly interesting because it is one of the chronologically oldest uh, areas in Herculaneum. It was rebuilt um, during the reign of Claudius. And one of the most interesting artifacts that we found was the couch that you can see on the right. Um, so again, very different pieces of information that contribute to a very nuanced image of the ancient world. And finally, not surprisingly, we also found information about papyri. Uh, this is one of the famous philosophical treatises, well, reconstructed philosophical treatise fragments um, that uh, were found in the famous Villa of Papyri at Herculaneum. So to draw some conclusions, uh, I showed you only a part of the various projects that the students performed, because um, again, we don't have the time to get into detail in the majority of these projects, but we all came to the agreement that there are some advantages in using this sort of exploration workflow um, in classical archeology span courses. So, Linked open data is important because it enables us to improve the discovery and the self-made research in these courses. It can also lead to something to some things that are not necessarily treated in traditional textbooks, like places like um, Ostia Antica, for example, or even Alexandria in Egypt herself are not particularly um, treated in especially introductions to to classical archaeology, um, and the powerful and the power of this sort of exploration is also that you can follow the evolution of these places um, according to the chronology of the historical evidence, which is of course something that traditional textbooks and classical archaeology do not always offer. Not for all the places that you may be interested in. So, and again, finally, I've said this multiple times. Um, the exploration provides you a much more varied evidence than what you can have 
through you know fixed resources like textbooks. So two advantages in particular I want to focus on. Discoverability, as we mentioned. Um, and this type of discoverability is different from the one that you may have by just running, running a search on Google. You will have the access to a variety of scholarly resources on the web that have been curated by uh, scholars. And you can make continuous and new discoveries by means of linked open data engines, like Periplayo, for example. You can also include archives and museums that are not necessarily particularly well known, um, like local archives and local museums. Second advantage, linked open data, provided that you, know, that you know how to navigate it and provided that you know what questions you want to ask, which is fairly important, um, improves the navigation into the complexity of these scholarly records. Um, you are able to navigate into like thousands of records and thousands of entries, but that gives you at the same time the idea that the cultural uh, cultural heritage site is an extremely complex picture, um, whose study is the result of different interconnections between pieces of evidence, and so you can perform by means of uh, linked open data resources. You can perform very different and very conscious types of research uh, across this variety of evidence. And you can navigate across the information of specialized data sets. For example, if you're particularly interest in, interested in just one coin, in just one particular type of evidence, one particular type of object, or if you're very interested in just one specific time period, you can also do that. You, can, you have means, you have filters to navigate into this, <clears throat> into this complexity. We also found some limitations, and I want to take a minute uh, at the end of this session to talk about these. Uh, two particular, particularly important limitations, in my opinion, have to be highlighted. Um, and this is not limited to Periplayo. It's a general um, understanding of the limitations of linked open data technologies for cultural heritage right now. Uh, one is the fact that there is still a relatively limited range of searchable resources. Um, across linked open data engines. Um, and this is probably a well-known problem in the world of um, web resources for the cultural heritage. And it's particularly connected to the necessity of a more widely shared vocabulary to express information. Um, oftentimes, databases that store information about cultural heritage do not necessarily use the same type of vocabulary to define their resources that are more widely understood. This is a hindrance to a variety of things. For example, well, I'm going to give you a very, very trivial example, vase types. For those of you who have some experience in looking for particular types of pottery um, in cultural heritage, you will know that there are different standards for defining a particular vase type. Um, and not always in the course of history, scholarship has agreed on these definitions. As a result, available collections of vases and pottery tend to follow very different vocabularies to describe that particular bit of information. So if I want to look for one specific type of vase, I may find much more problems than solutions at this point if I want to look for one specific type of pottery by means of linked open data technologies. And this is also related to the second thing, to the second limitation. While considerable investments have been made to improve this infrastructure of linked open data, there is still, we still need massive efforts uh, to make the data actually open and usable through this infrastructure. Um, you have seen in the list of the partners of Pelagios that I showed you before that there are some uh, contributors that are much more prominent than others. Um, and this also particularly depends on the availability of information according to you know, the geographical context, for example, as well. There needs to be a lot of effort to gather information about specific sites that are still not even just in linked open data cloud, they're just not even available online. Um, and this is an effort that, this is a 
lifetime effort, of course, that doesn't have a lot to do with the linked open data infrastructure. It has to do with um, the availability of resources to make this possible to harvest the data from the sites and the museums, um, the willingness of archives and museums to make their data open and usable and users in a way that may and can contribute to the collection of these data to a certain extent. So this may be also a call for action uh, for people who are in the scholarship of classical archaeology and cultural heritage on the web in particular. So thank you so much. And I'm listing our contacts here. My students, Caroline, Rebecca, James, and Eleanor, they will be at the DH 2019 in Utrecht in July. Um, and me, uh, Chiara Palladino, thank you so much. And I think that we can open the field to um, questions, I guess. Okay, so Chiara, thank you very much. Uh, one thing, uh, as you said, of course, we need uh, more data, but I, I can add one thing. In 2010, nine years ago, I was teaching a class at Tufts University on Alexandria, and then we had uh, also a course on Latin epigraphy, and then six weeks uh, in uh, Rome with Tufts students. And at the time, definitely, we didn't have these resources. And I can see now, for example, Alexandra, the archaeology of Alexandra <coughs> is extremely complex uh, because, well, we don't have enough resources and then the city is a stratification. But now and a project like this uh, would have been very difficult, especially for undergraduate students. But now we have these resources. I'm not saying that uh, is easier now, for example, to learn the archaeology of Alexandra, but definitely these resources uh, help a lot also in terms of pictures and then other uh, information. The same for epigraphy, well, for Ostia, definitely remember, we had this course on site, looking desperately for, uh, well, of course, there are many pictures, but I, I can see the difference in nine years. Of course, there is a lot to do. We still have... Uh, a lot of work to do. We, we have a war for generations, <laughs> but I'm happy to see now where we are. So maybe, probably I could teach again a course on Alexandria with uh, more material, especially online material. Anyway, so we can open the discussion and Chiara, thank you. Also, it was very uh, interesting to see how to do a project like this in a, in a classroom in a department of classics. So we have, okay, we have um, a comment in the chat. I don't know, Chiara, if you can read it. Yes, chat. I've seen it. Okay, so is uh, Anise, our uh, mm -hmm. guest from Brazil. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, so yes. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. <laughs> you should go to Brazil again for... Um... We're, we're working on that. <laughs> okay, excellent. <clears throat> Linked open data in Araraquara. We want that. <laughs> yes. Other questions? So don't be shy. Maybe I have students in the Hangout. I know that they are uh, students uh, in computer science and in digital humanities. So this uh, session was definitely more on the classical component, I have to say, a lot of archaeology and epigraphy, so many uh, well, things. But linked open data is, is a fundamental technology in general for the semantic web and for sharing resources. So not only for the ancient world, even, even if now we have also linked open data for the ancient world. So maybe I understand that uh, you have to think about this session. Um, but you, you can use these resources, so these are not only for uh, for classicists, they are, you can access them. Yeah, again, and I should say that the majority of my students were not classicists. Uh, like only two of the students that I showed you, whose projects I showed you were classicists at the time were majoring, but the other two were majors and were majoring in completely different resource, in completely different disciplines. Um, and I should also say as an anecdote, I, when I decided to do this experiment with them, we didn't anticipate that uh, it would have turned into something really interesting. Um, it was honestly really a test. Uh, this is why we didn't necessarily think about making it more coherent or establishing a specific workflow for things to find or for um, contextualizing information, for creating papers about it. Because um, 
again it was it came out completely of the blue i have to say um but since there we have seen that there there is interest i will repropose this again next semester in my future course in classical archaeology and we will make it uh, even more coherent and more intentional to to be honest because this was this was completely uh this was extremely surprising to us uh to be honest to be accepted in conferences and to be invited to um reporter projects um it was it was really interesting so again it's still a work in progress so to say <laughs> well that's good i have to say because this is the spirit of synoikis also the beginning uh, basically we are classicists so we were very worried we have to choose a topic a period of time the discipline because otherwise <laughs> it doesn't work and then in the end we said no 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 we go on with technologies so our <laughs> <laughs> linking topics and technologies and then we go well not randomly but basically as you can see in the syllabus of this semester so we have different definitely different topics related to classics but the connecting elements are the technologies and i yeah. think i hope it works <laughs> uh, i think so and and gabby is in the chat and i think he can i think that gabby has a question okay yes <laughs> Yeah, no, I have a question related to related to that, actually. I was wondering, um, and apologies if you mentioned this at the very beginning, because I, I joined a bit late, but um, I was wondering, uh, sort of in two parts, what um, what role this this particular assessment that your students did played in the assessment of the course as a whole? So what proportion of that, if, if it, and related to that, was there was there also a written component of this where they had to write and report on what they'd done and the, the theoretical side of it and so forth? Yes, um, so they had to produce a paper about the entire thing by stating their method, what they wanted to achieve, the questions that they asked, and uh, state also advantages and problems. Uh, so the slides that I actually showed about the limitations and the advantages are basically condensing the results of those observations. Um, and this was a midterm project. So at the time um, in the course, we were just starting to touch like how you, analyze, how you analyze the evidence on an archaeological site. Uh, how do you put together different pieces of information? So my intention was to, you know, throw them into this extreme complexity of navigation of different types of artifacts and different types of things and see if they were able to narrate a coherent story um, out of that. And I think that many of them actually did a fabulous job. Um, one of the reasons why I used linked open data to do that, because I could have used anything really, but the reason why I did that is because we always talk about linked open data and the cultural heritage and other things that use linked open data and so on. But then when it comes to the user, we still have very little idea about how this is actually going to serve a user. Um, somebody who wants to look for information about a specific site or a specific artifact or a specific text and so on. Uh, we have a fuzzy idea of how that's going to happen, but that has never happened so far um, in my experience. So I just wanted to provide this as a sort of use case to what we can do to what a user and student in this case can do uh, with the resources that are provided, because I think it's a very useful perspective to have. Thank you. Yeah, and to the, the the boring part of the question, how much of their final grade was was based on this this exercise? Um, okay. It was a midterm. I think it was a thirty percent of the grade. Okay, nice. Yeah, cool. I, I I very much like your comments about the um, how do we know who our users are and what our users actually will do with this stuff. I think that's as you say, that's something that we so seldom do. Or if we do, we do as an afterthought, you know, after it's too late to fix it, if we if we realize there's so many things but at the end of the project. So I think that's yeah. really important. I think what, what you're doing is is actually a service to other people who are who are building this sort of tool because they can they can look at, you know, they can get feedback on on existing tools. So, yeah. Very, very cool. Thank you. Yes, I think this is a fundamental component also for students to work uh, on these projects. They are extant projects, public projects. They work on, on data, so they contribute to, to, to real data, living data, and uh, they help the community. So I think mm -hmm. this is one of the, the most interesting things. And if I remember at the beginning of the session, you said that you gave them five minutes for their presentation. Yeah. 
Okay, wow. So <laughs> there were 24 students. We had to, you know. <laughs> okay, well, well, so I'm very generous because I have 61 students this year. <laughs> And I give them 20 minutes, so that's why we have many seminars. But now and then, well, maybe sometimes they tell me, really, 20 minutes is a lot. No, it's nothing. <laughs> but <laughs> it, is, it is really nothing. And five minutes was just enough for some of them to present about the specific artifacts that they found. Um, but, but again, uh, no. the, the written form was more articulated for them in this particular case. Anyway, five minutes is important to learn to summarize yeah. things. So to, to, you know, the, and we did have a timer. Uh, yes, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the slide, I could read that about the timer. So I said, wow, so <laughs> very, very strict. But I understand with 24 students, of course, uh, you, you need that. And also to learn, this is important. So to be very, very clear about um, your project. Okay. So, I don't know if there are other questions. No questions? Okay, so, and uh, in, uh, on YouTube, uh, I don't see questions. In any case, uh, you have, uh, uh, as usual, the class outline on GitHub, so with a full description of this, then uh, we also have slides, they are already there, and then readings, further readings, uh, to about uh, not only um, the ancient world, but linked open data in general. And, um, and then also an exercise, an essay title. Uh, and please, you can try to use these, uh, uh, these resources, uh, really, uh, because um, they are quite um, well user friendly, I have to say. <laughs> a few yeah. things experience, so definitely. Uh, okay, so I think. That's it for today. And so I'm looking at the, our syllabus, uh, our program. So next week, we don't have a session because it's holiday in Germany. So we are following uh, the German academic calendar. But uh, we will be here again in two weeks on June 6. And we will have a session about digital representations of date and time. And I will be one of the... Um, Instructions with um, Gabriel Baudet, who is today with us in uh, in the hangout. Okay, so I think that's that's it for today. So Chiara, uh, thank you very much for your uh, for your session today, and so have a good uh, afternoon. Well, it's afternoon, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry. Okay, many different time zones, so it's almost lunch for you. And, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So thank you very much, and see you in two weeks. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. Bye. Ciao. Bye.